Guys, welcome to another episode of TA Outdoors. In the previous one, Alec helped me forge this steel striker and we managed to get some a uh, little bit of a spark going Absolutely, on we made fire, which was pretty exciting. This is why I came here, guys, really. You can't see it! <laughs> this is what we came here for, a bushcraft knife. This is kind of my sketch, it's not amazing. This is what we're gonna go for. Alec's gonna teach you some tips as well on what we need to do because really, guys, I don't know anything about blacksmithing at all other than what I've learned yesterday. Should be good fun, hope you enjoy it. So we've already flattened out earlier, Alex helped me a piece of O1 steel, which is fairly common in bushcraft knives. Alex doing a demo piece alongside my piece here, just so he can teach me the basics really of getting that bushcraft knife shape. Into the fire she goes! Now you see what's happening is as we forge it down, it's thickening up. So you turn it sideways, hold your piece, hold your piece level to the anvil, there we go, and then flatten it with your flat side of the hammer. Then we're gonna mark where our next groove is, and it's a slightly larger diameter. So we'll now come in over here, and we can use the horn like that. What we're gonna start doing is we can start dipping in to that nice little swell we want. So with that mark, we can then take the round side of the hammer and use the round side of the hammer to form it. Work up to that little choil there and form that shape. Is just keep aiming right there and don't hit that mark there sure. until, uh, until we really want to gently work into it. bend in here, so what you can do is you can lay that across the whole length of the anvil and you can just very gently caress your hammer across it and get yourself the straightness that it is that you want. Well folks, here is the bushcraft knife so far. As you can see the profile, we've got a little bit of a drop point here at the top, which we're gonna 
Alec tells me we're now going to refine on the grinder. We've normalized it. Time for the next stage. We've measured it to the grip of my hand. It's much, much better. Originally, I did have this kind of belly a little bit bigger, but we've ground that down a bit more and it fits a lot more comfortable now so that my knuckle of my forefinger here goes right up to the choil, which is what I wanted. Now, you may notice there's some blue stuff on here. Alec, what is it? Now that is blue dicum, which is this blue stuff here. It's a dye that you put on metal, which then allows you to make a scratch mark. You get this wonderful contrast between the scratch and the dark blue, so it means that you have an accurate scratch line you can work to. For this knife, especially because we're doing like a Scandinavian grind, a Scandi grind, really important that edge is completely centered to it. And so we'll take this, this is a height gauge, has a carbide tip, we can find the center, give it a scribe. And now, when Mike and I go back into the grinding room and I show him how to grind this bevel and he grinds this bevel, he's gonna be able to grind it to the scribe line, keep that edge straight down the whole way. We're gonna keep it a little bit thick because after that, after we drill some holes, it's gonna be time to go into the heat treat. And when we heat treat it, we want that edge to be thick so it's not warping all around. And so that all that nice work we did to keep the edge straight isn't, uh, isn't wasted by being warped in the heat treat. Once you know you're in the right angle, apply pressure. Sweet. As you come to this, this left hand comes out so that you keep that bevel on it and finish like this. One smooth motion the whole way through. So we've put the Scandi grind on now, which Alec actually helped to refine towards the end there. And I have to admit, that's probably one of the hardest things that, uh, that I've experienced from this whole project is doing the grinding itself. A lot harder than it looks. We put, well, Alex put some blue dicum on there and we've marked out holes now where we're gonna put the pins in for these scales. So what we're doing at the moment, guys, we've had a bit of a problem with the drill bits. I think we've gone through three, is it, Alex? About, th about three drill bits or so. Yeah, we've gone through three already. Uh, Alex actually gone to sharpen them on the grinder, haven't you? Yep, I've sharpened the tiny little drill bits and still uh, they won't cut the material. We annealed it overnight and it's just too hard to get cut by the high-speed steel drill bits. Yeah, it's going to be a good knife, though. It is, once we get some holes in it for some pins. It'd be <laughs> nice to have the scales stay on. You it know? would be, yeah, it would be. And so machinists, look away because we are now doing some good machining sacrilege. We're putting a carbide end mill in a Jacob's chuck. So you can see guys that Alec has now countersunk the holes. We've got six holes in there for the handle for the scales. We're going to normalize the knife to harden it and then temper it. She's a fine blade. 
So after the forging process, all the grinding, there are lots of stresses in here, and it has a very wide grain structure, very thick grain structure, not good for having a nice strong blade. So the first thing we're gonna do before we harden it, get it hard enough to hold the edge, is we're gonna make it strong enough to be able to take that hardening and hold the edge and be strong. We're normalizing it, equalizing the stresses across the whole thing. In the forge here, we've got a tube in there so that we can get a nice even heat without any hot spots. And so in we go for normalizing cycle. Number one, we're going to heat it up to a critical temperature. And so there we go. We're just simply going to let that cool down to room temperature. Further down, further down. There we go. This is the point in time where it, it, it could very likely crack, so we cross our fingers and hope that it doesn't. Is... We need to select the wood. So the knife has been tempered, been cooking away in the oven. And what we're gonna do now is go back into the grinding room uh, to get that edge nice and sharp and clean it up a bit. That's a beauty. It's a beauty. Straight off the belt, already sharp. It is, arm shavingly sharp. <laughs> little drop there, little drop there. Flip her over, make sure we've got plenty of clearance. Let the glue dry. All the way through, you know, once you're into here. Um, then pull up. we got this here. It's a little screw, so that hopefully we'll stop that spinning. But again, we want to be careful that we don't bind it. So you want to make sure that when you lift up with the drill, you're applying downwards pressure so it doesn't come up at an angle. If it comes up at an angle, we're going to cam it and it'll You'll end up with a 2,000 RPM spinning blade. Lovely. <laughs> Scribe around the edges, so we know a little indication of where everything is. And now, break it off. Joys of super glue. Then we'll super glue her on to the other side. You see, I've taken the uh, small wheel there on the belt grinder and we've ground in there. That gives us 60 grit and a little more surface area for the glue to adhere to. We're gonna be using epoxy. Epoxy likes actually to be a little bit thicker in its bond. And so that helps get it to have a little bit of a thicker bond. It also means that we just get a little more surface area because of the higher grit to, uh, to really contact onto our epoxy. We've also primed the surface of our scales themselves with, a, again, a little bit of 180 grit. We think the epoxy is pretty much set. Well, it's, it's, it's <laughs> close. It needs a little more time, but it'll do for now. But now we're going to work on the actual handle itself, get it nice and ergonomical, get it comfortable, and then we should be pretty much there. Absolutely. So we're going to go make some dust.
So there we go. Look at that lovely finish. And we've, we've just put a layer of linseed, linseed oil just to cover it. Used pretty much every bit of sandpaper that Alec has here <laughs> to get that nice finish. But that wood has come up so good. Guys, I hope you enjoyed that build. It has been the best project of my life for sure. Having never done blacksmithing before, I have to say, Alec, it was awesome. Hey, you did fantastically, and I'm, I'm thrilled that you came. It's been a lot of fun. It's so, incredible. Uh, and look at that grind. Look at that grind we've got. You did a lot of it. You've got to take some credit there. Uh, yeah, and the grinding is difficult. He did, he did a fantastic job of that. Yeah, definitely the hardest thing I'd say of this whole project was the grinding. So difficult keeping the angles. It, it's not yeah. the physical labor part of it. It's the actual tiny little movements that you need to do to get that grind, but it's been awesome. We've left that kind of finish on it. You know, that sort of raw finish. Antique, antique look, yeah, it's, just, it's the scale and it looks good. And it helps remind me of what it previously looked like. Don't forget guys, you've got to head over to Alex's channel for literally everything blacksmithing. He's uploading very regularly. So make sure you go and hit the sub button and say hi to him from me. Great, well thanks. I look forward to seeing you guys there. It's been a, it's been a pleasure being on your channel. Thanks so thank much. you for coming here. Cheers. So I'm out here in the woods and I've got the knife I've just made with Alex Steel. Uh, I'll give, give you guys a quick close up of it and then we're gonna put it to the test and see what it can do. So here's the knife itself with the Lignum Vitae scales, one of the hardest woods in the world this, one of the hardest trade woods in the world. I believe it's from the Caribbean. Uh, really awesome, awesome wood. I've never had, I've never seen a wood like this. Um, never, certainly on a knife anyway. O1 tool steel as we said at the beginning of the video. I don't know if you saw there, when I was grinding it, I put in a bit of text, because this is a, this is a very high bevel for a Scandi grind. It's almost double what it normally would be. That's because I, <laughs> being a first time at grinding, I didn't exactly get it perfectly right. Alec helped me, so it's sort of turned more into what I would call a sabre grind now, which is obviously a much higher up. You can see that bevel is much higher than a typical Scandinavian grind would be down here, about halfway. And again, nice, about four, four and a half inch blade, which I like really ergonomic handle. I did have this belly, as I was saying, a little bit bigger, but actually I'm quite glad it's thinner because I can just wrap my fists around it a lot more now. I like it when the scales go right up to the choil here, the wood handle, and I like a good curve for my uh, forefinger just there. You can see where I've cut my knuckle on the grinder there. But yeah, I like to be able to come right up against that so that when I'm feather sticking, I've got all the control that I can get. You may notice here, there's a little divot and that's Alex actually done that with a file. I've never seen it done on a knife before, but he makes a good point. Basically, when you're sharpening this against a, a whetstone, uh, a lot of the time, especially if you're a beginner and you're sharpening a knife on a whetstone, you can end up cutting in towards the choil. And what this helps do is just prevent that because you can rest that edge of the blade right on the bevel there, right on the whetstone, and you should be fine then to just keep it straight. And that way you don't cut in towards the bevel itself. So. It's one of Alex's tips really for sharpening, which I quite like. We've left that uh, sort of oxidized type finish on it. I quite like that. You don't usually see that very often in uh, bushcraft knives. And it's got six pins in it there to keep the handle in place. A lot of knives have sort of two pins, two big pins, but we've gone for six because we like to be a bit different. I would say a few things that I'm wary of if, is with the grind or the bevel being so high, uh, it's much more likely to fold over where it's a bit more you know, it, 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 where it's the angle's a bit tight like that, the tip, when it hits into it, if you imagine that's the tip of the knife, it can bend and fold over a lot more, so you can get a lot more folds. It's, you know, sort of not as strong as a, a typical Scandinavian grind, but being O1 steel, it's, it should be strong enough to do battening work and things like that. And that's why I wanted the longer knife, so that I can hold it like this, well away from the blade, and, you know, get bigger pieces of wood, that sort of width and still have plenty of room to button down on the tip here. So let's put it to the test. First test, I'm gonna start fairly small, uh, is this is a bit of silver birch, which is grows a lot in the current woodland that I'm in. This is dead, this is dead wood. It's been dead a while, so it should be fairly easy to chop and split. Nice straight grain on it, which should make it easy for battening. I'm gonna use another piece of birch as a baton to hit the back of the knife. That's why I wanted a nice thick width at the top here of the steel, thick steel, because I needed that power when battening. So here we go, moment of truth. When I'm battening, I like to use this part of the blade because not only does it give me a lot more control, 
but it allows me a couple of inches over this side to be able to hit down and get that power. Typically when you're battening, if you're going to hit the tip of the knife here, it, you can see the back of the handle is going to kick up like that. So you want to be able to lock your hand here and allow for that kick that's going to happen by pushing down sometimes. So sometimes your knife will end up doing this going down the wood, which is fine. But we'll give it a go and see if it breaks on me. I'm going to start with some light taps just to get the blade in there. There we go. Let's check the blade after that. We are looking good. No folds, no flex coming back at me. Awesome. So let's split that piece, let's split it again. A little bit harder now. Wow. <laughs> it goes through bone like batter. That is awesome, that splits really well. You turn it towards you guys a bit so you can see. Falls open. Let's try a fatter piece. This is this is a bit fatter. Let's try this piece. I've split these with an axe previously. Check the blade. No flex, no folds. Wow, that's sharp. Do you know what? I didn't even strop that after we took that off the grinder. That's not even been stropped or, or honed, so that is lethal sharp. I'm impressed. I thought that would fold over, if I'm honest. Being a sort of sabre grind, I thought that would definitely fold a bit more. Let's uh, split a couple more. This one looks knotty AF. Oh, yes. I'll show you in a minute the bevel. There's, there's no flex on it at all. That's a knotty piece of wood. You can see the knots in it here. So the next test is the tip, which is something I, I do use a lot of with the, with a bushcraft knife and splitting it, if I come in on that. Again, where the groin and the bevel's gone so high, it's meant that the tip here is really quite thin. It usually the angle will be a lot, a lot sort of uh, shallower angle. It's quite a steep angle there, which, which means it could break. It could snap at the tip. So, so for this test, I'm just gonna split the wood by holding the knife like this and uh, basically stabbing down on it. I like to hold it with the bevel away from me because if I cut and slip like that, you've got arteries and everything in your arm here that could run across the blade, which I would rather not. If I was gonna cut myself, I'd rather it be my fingers than my arteries. So I always turn the blade away from me. And Oh, she splits, how's the tip? Tip is still intact. Yeah, seems to be splitting fine. It's enough to get it into sort of small, small pieces for firewood. And the tip seems to be. Yeah, we're st we're still intact here. Uh, let's try. This piece. She'd be splitting all right. That splits fine tip is still intact. The tip of it is still intact as well. And if I clean that off, there's no flex yet running back from me. You know, the, be the bevel's not rolled over, which is good. Again, when feather sticking, everything's away from me because I don't want to be cutting in the triangle of death in here and in my leg, my femoral artery arteries. So cutting away and Given that this has such a high bevel, I won't need to dig in much. I won't need to change the angle in, in much of the feather stick. It should just be fairly shallow because it's being that sort of sabre grind. So we'll see. Wow. That does. You barely got to move it.
bit of a bent, bent bit here, but tiny thin curls. That is unreal. The sharpness of that. Unbelievable. It makes feather sticking so easy. It's one beast of a knife. Try really fine curls. Being it's got a really high bevel, I can get some really thin feather sticks going. Which, great for rainy conditions when lighting with a fire still, you need the sort of thinnest wood possible. Designed by yourself as well, when you've designed your own knife and made your own knife. I don't think anything could be more satisfying. Oh, I love it. Absolutely love it. Okay, one of the other things that's important with the bushcraft knife is having that 90 degree spine. That just pure 90 degree right angle to work on a, on a fire still like this. And, you know, it just gives you the best opportunity to be able to straight, scrape sparks from it. Which this, if I zoom back, seems to be doing pretty well. It's just my normal fire still that I use. Plenty of sparks coming off this. There you go. We have fire. It works, people. Good old Alex Steel and his 01 Steel. I think that last one blew out, so we will try again. Just made a baby feather stick. Real small one. Trying to expose the feathers a bit more because there's not loads in it. There's one. Well, it works. Fire. Cool. And then, if I were to have a proper fire, I'd just tentatively build this up. All the... All the curls. Really chuffed with this knife. Really chuffed with it. So much better than I thought. That, not, not, <laughs> not to be offence to you, Alec, but... It's awesome. I didn't think I could design something that would actually work like this, which is really cool. So, super pleased. She's a beaut. Gonna let that go out now. Oh. Well, what can I say other than thank you, Alec, for giving me the opportunity to be able to create my own knife from scratch, from a piece of O1 steel, and turn it into something really practical. So massive thanks to Alec, and thanks to you guys for watching the video. I'll be using this a lot more in future videos as well. I think I'm gonna name it, I've been thinking about this. I think I'm gonna name this the Lignum Steeler. Lignum Vitae handles, Alec Steel helped me make it. Lignum Steeler. What do you think guys? Only knife, it's cool to know it's the only knife like this in the world, because I made it. It's nice to have that exclusivity of it, which is cool to know it's the only knife in the world that's sort of like this. 
Obviously there's loads similar, but the fact that I made it is just awesome. Thanks Alec for helping me make the Lignum Steeler. You guys go and check out his channel. And I'll see you soon in the next video.